the free garden from Colombia. Uh, doesn't really need an introduction being essentially one of the founding father of what we do here in the in mainly, although not exclusively, founding father of the law and finance field. I see a lot of law and finance colleagues uh, in, in this virtual meeting. So without further ado, I would just give the floor to Professor Geoffrey Gordon to present his, his recent paper on systematic stewardship, uh, uh, presenting a very interesting and original angle to the hot topic of institutional investor stewardship. Professor Jeff Gordon, we are very happy to have you. Please take the floor and feel free to also interact. If people want to ask questions, sure. Hold your fire, hold your fire for now, put it in the chat. We have plenty of time, about half an hour towards the end of the meeting to for QA. Thanks a lot, Professor Gordon. So it's nice to see see everyone. Uh, um, I've taught over Zoom for uh, I guess uh, a year. And so this is, I mean, you may as well be in a Zoom class, right? That's how uh, to think of it, perhaps. Um, but I think maybe by next fall, um, it, you know, it'll be possible to gather again and, and see and see, see one another in more uh, direct ways. And I certainly look forward to a resumption of that sort of interchange. <clears throat> um, let me, uh, and it's nice to see some folks here who I've known uh, for quite quite a while, um, Joe uh, and and Giuseppe, and there perhaps are others. Um, let me put up some slides here. Okay. Um, All right, so the paper and, and thus the talk is about um, what I call systematic stewardship. Um, and what is that about? Well, stewardship has obviously been uh, much in the, in the news. It's, it's sort of a theme for the way that shareholders are supposed to behave. Um, it really arises out of a a confluence of two different things, one of which is the increasing extent to which share ownership um, is held in the hands of large institutional owners, which, which overcomes uh, the collective action challenges of dispersed share ownership. So it potentiates a certain kind of shareholder voice. Um, and then secondly, I, I think, the call for stewardship arises in significant part because uh, it appears that governments are unable to address some of the most serious issues that we face. Um, perhaps that's in part because of the nature of global firms, which transcend uh, any single government. Um, uh, perhaps because the issues involved are global issues. The climate change issue, for example, is a global issue. So, so the hope really, I think, is, is for a form of global governance that depends upon the shareholders of um, these large firms to play a, a, a very significant role. Share ownership is transnational and so if you can change the way the shareholders behave, then you can achieve certain outcomes, which uh, the present resources of national governments can, cannot achieve. Um, so uh, stewardship really had UK uh, roots. I'm sure this group knows that. Um, and, and really for a long time, uh, the UK had, had large owners. Um, uh, my, my colleague Jack Coffey and then Bernie Black wrote a paper about this um, 25 year, years ago, uh, which referred to the way that, that um, the institutional investors in the UK exerted what we might call stewardship over firms. Um, they got together and, and acted in a collective way. Um, 
And so basically the hope, as I've said, is, is that the large owners today can act as stewards uh, uh, through, uh, particularly on environmental issues, social issues too, um, a soft law approach rather than a hard law approach in part because there isn't a government big enough to create a hard law to govern these firms. There's a separate stream uh, that feeds into the stewardship uh, river, however, and that is the idea of the universal owner, which again is also 20 years old. The idea that if um, a shareholder, a, a fully diversified shareholder owning a portfolio of stocks will, will necessarily internalize all the externalities associated with the behavior of those firms. Um, I don't think that's strictly true, but as a metaphor, it kind of works. And so the idea is that the um, investor becomes um, uh, a social planner. Um, because the investor in effect sees everything, then the investor uh, can be able to plan as, as a maximizing social planner might. It actually really um, doesn't work super well in part because uh, those who own shares are, are reflect the top part of the distribution of wealth, obviously. And so they're not gonna be um, as concerned as one might like for um, the full set of, of people. Um, uh, and secondly, then, then you're, you're back in the idea with the hope that governments can perhaps influence these universal owners by being the value creators that the universal owners are going to be putting in play. And it's not clear that those are necessarily the ones that will produce outcomes that everyone wants. Um, so uh, more generally, the challenge I think about stewardship is the business model of the asset manager. And so a large part of what I'm about today is to try to come up with a theory of stewardship that in effect fits that business model. And so uh, the asset managers to whom we look will find the approach incentive compatible uh, with their business model. And, and what's that model? That asset managers essentially compete on relative performance measures, um, that they're, uh, um, uh, that superior relative performance measure in stock mar market returns will lead to an increase in the assets that, that they manage. They also compete on lowest fees and, um, so basically what you end, what, what you have is what I describe as the limit case is uh, the maximally diversified broad-based index fund, uh, which has very low fees, ma maximum diversification. And the question is what kind of stewardship can we expect from uh, um, uh, a vehicle set up in that way? So, Another introductory point, uh, stewardship really, uh, it, it, it originates perhaps in the UK, but in general, in today's discussion, it has a European flavor. Um, I think Europe was ahead of the US in the stewardship approach, perhaps in part because they're uh, uh, firms in Europe which have a different business model than the traditional asset managers in the United States. And I would think also with, with, um, uh, with work on the um, AIFMD2 um, underway, um, which is going to have, it seems, a requirement for ESG reporting with a focus on sustainable finance. This may lead to additional attention to stewardship in Europe, which uh, is even greater than you might see in the United States. And, and I guess another, again, uh, beginning point is, is um, there are different ways to try to tame uh, the, the present business model we now have. And um, stewardship is really a different approach, I think, than the pur purpose approach that Colin Mayer and others have uh, produced. So, um, uh, uh, what are the kinds of stewardship we see in the United States? 
So one approach is, is asset managers coming up with guidelines for, for example, good governance that they expect to be, expect to be implemented across their portfolio. Um, another form of stewardship is, is performance focus, um, engagement on a firm by firm basis. Uh, Lucian Bev, Bev Chuck and, and Scott Hurst have recently pushed that. Um, Ron Gilson and I um, really um, are looking to uh, an interaction between the activists, the hedge funds um, and uh, the owners who are rationally reticent, which is to say they will respond but not initiate as a kind, you might put that in a stewardship category. Um, and, and the question before the house really is, is ESG. And here I, I think, you know, you have to unpack ESG. I think the idea of collapsing environment, social and governance into a single, a single index is kind of a, not a useful idea, but in any event, the question is whether environmental and social stewardship is that possible and feasible. So the goal of what I'm about here, systematic stewardship is to, is to provide a foundation by a form of engagement by large institutional investors and asset managers uh, uh, with their portfolio firms um, that fits their theory of investing and their low cost business model. I mean, that's what I'm about here is to come up with, with a model that, that will work for these funds. And, and the core idea is drawn from, from modern portfolio theory that investors want to maximize risk adjusted returns, not expected returns. Um, and while you can with broad-based portfolio diversification eliminate so-called idiosyncratic risk, you cannot eliminate systematic risk. Um, well, well, what does this mean from a stewardship perspective? Um, it means that firm by firm engagement, particularly for performance reasons, will have quite diminished returns precisely because a lot of those effects will be idiosyncratic. Uh, so I kind of rule out the, the Bebshock and Hearst approach for those reasons. But I do think that is, it is a plausible goal for a widely diversified investor like an index fund to try to reduce systematic risk. Um, and, and so in a sense, that's part of the point here. Take advantage of the fact that we're dealing with ma maximally diversified funds and ask what is the kind of stewardship that fits their business model and their approach, and you end up with systematic stewardship, which proves to be very powerful, I think. The, in a sense, the critical move I want to underscore, because it moves away from a trade-off model. Um, the usual story is that we're prepared to accept lower returns in exchange for some very important other value, like climate preserving uh, measures. Um, or again, a trade-off on some other uh, dimension, financial stability will take lower returns because we'll get a more stable financial system. The, the point of systematic stewardship is, is um, there is no trade-off. That if climate change presents systematic risk, if, if the if, if, um, uh, uh, financial uh, if aggressive behavior threatens financial stability, then reducing those risks um, will increase uh, risk adjusted returns. Um, it's not again, uh, it's not socially responsible investing on the one hand, um, investors on the other. If you see this as the goal of producing uh, the maximum risk adjusted returns, then reducing systematic risk um, uh, uh, is actually better for investors as well as better for the environment, say, in a safer um, financial sector. So, um, so the summary of the, the rest of the talk is um, the 
paper is, is the nature of systematic risk, um, an argument against index fund engagement in firm stewardship designed to enhance performance. Um, I think I may not spend time on that. Um, the arguments that, I mean, the cases that I think present systematic risk that are significant enough that they ought to be addressed, climate change risk, financial stability, social stability. Um, I wanna talk some about what, what, what the implications from the point of view of the behavior of these funds um, would be, be entailed by the approach that I'm suggesting and the possibilities. I, I, I mean, basically I think for political economy reasons, these funds should essentially lead from behind. Uh, that basically they should um, see themselves as, as voting their shares as sh shareholders do rather than leading the charge. But nevertheless, this could empower the activists. They could respond in strong, positive ways to initiate uh, initiatives by others. Um, they can empower management by supporting management against activists who, who would ask management to disregard systematic values. Um, and of course, there are certain things they might do, especially by way of uh, guidelines um, and in the special case on firms. And then finally, I want to address the common ownership critique because that's obviously, anytime you suggest that large investors ought to behave in a, um, a particular way, uh, you, you raise uh, the antitrust concerns, the common ownership concerns that have been very important, at least in the literature in the United States. So um, those are, that's kind of the, uh, the outline of the talk. I've, I'm gonna actually stop sharing screen because I, I just wanna talk rather than just use PowerPoint here. Um, let me see if I can figure out, okay. All right. Um, so I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about systematic risk. Um, now, it falls out in a natural way from uh, simple accounts of portfolio theory. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's standard that um, uh, in competitive securities markets, investors are compensated for bearing systematic risk. Um, decades of work in financial economics have tried to uh, drill down on the nature of systematic risk. And there are two general ap approaches that you see, one of which is, is what I would describe as a structural approach, which is an effort to um, look at the different uh, fundamental economic features and ask how they bear on this undiversifiable risk. But actually, and, and that's a little bit what beta is about, I suppose, but, but actually most of the work has been on, on the, in, in, in the finance space has been um, more on the, the anything that will predict, <laughs> anything that will predict the performance of stock prices, uh, any, any factor, um, that will predict in a, a systematic way the performance of stock prices um, gets identified and, and valued because it's predictive. And so you see have a lot of uh, data mining in that, that regard um, rather than a structural approach. There's a different approach, however, which I think is certainly the one that I kind of relate to. And, and, and that is um, to look at the influence the systematic influences of rare disasters they're called in the literature. Um, and, and so any particular disaster is, you know, a black swan. Um, but seen as a class, it seems that rare disasters are foreseeable. And indeed there are um, scholars who, who basically 
um, think that these so-called so tail risk, nevertheless, as a category, have a significant effect on stock prices in general. And indeed, they think the equity premium really is about um, the collective black swan risk, uh, which is really a, a systematic risk, um, uh, in a sense. I mean, it is a systematic risk. And, and, and so um, the finance scholars seem to take these market risks as exogenous. Um, but actually, the, the claim of, of systematic stewardship is that the nature of systematic risks is, in fact, behavior related. It's endogenous to the behavior of firms. And the clearest case, I think, is with respect to, to financial stability. Um, if, if firms are constrained in certain ways uh, so that the um, financial system as a whole is more stable, then I think um, that's going to have a systematic effect. And it's not just that there are these exogenous shocks. There's not much to be done. In fact, the claim of really of the systematic stewardship approach is that, yes, we can actually modify um, uh, the systematic risk by restraining the behavior of firms, which can, can uh, create it. Um, so what are the specific um, uh, cases for systematic risk? Well, the climate change uh, risk as systematic, that's, that's straight forward. Um, uh, you know, the central banks have obviously been very concerned with, with the, the channels by which systematic risk might express itself. One of the, um, I mean, part of the reason that climate change risk is a worthy target for systematic stewardship is, is not only because its impact may produce sharp declines in G GDP and thus losses across a diversified securities portfolio, but because the manifestations are unpredictable. Um, they're truly, you know, I mean, they're black swan slash white swan events um, and, and they're, they're not gonna be gradual. They're gonna be abrupt. If, if the Greenland glacier slides into the Atlantic, that's gonna have a nonlinear effect on climate, um, on ocean currents and <laughs> Uh, tremendous effect across a diversified portfolio of uh, diversified portfolio of securities. So the second category is financial stability risk, and I think after the global financial crisis of 2007-09 and the European financial crisis of 2010-12, I don't think the systematic nature of that risk has to be uh, elaborated on. Uh, let me just say a brief word about what I think is another possible category, social stability risk. Um, a brief word here. In some, I think inequality is perhaps overstated as a social stability risk, but economic insecurity is underrated. And, and ironically, the shareholder empowerment that has resulted from reconcentration of share ownership has heightened economic insecurity. Um, and uh, um, I kind of elaborate on that a little bit in the paper, but um, there are two major influences involved here. One of which is that reconcentration of, of, of share ownership in the characteristic form that both that, that permits systematic stewardship also um, energizes um, activists who go after firms for underperformance um, and, and thereby uh, reduce the level of, of so-called slack at firms, which has implications for employees. Uh, firms are much quicker to make adaptations, which um, uh, may increase wealth overall, which may be good for the shareholders, but um, the immediate 
social adjustment cost bears are the employees. And furthermore, the particular form of in which ownership takes, which is diversification at the portfolio level, <clears throat> results in pressure on individual firms to be to, to reduce diversification at the firm level, which from the perspective of employees means that if there's economic pressure on one particular business segment of the firm, in a diversified firm, there's some other place within the firm to move to. If as the firm becomes less diversified, more focused, um, there's less room within the firm for employees to migrate. And so when, when <clears throat> Uh, the firm re rebalances its economic activity. This leads more displacement outside of the firm and in that way, a higher level of, of adjustment costs and to that extent, greater economic insecurity. So, so my point is, is, is one could um, think that a systematic steward has to be particularly concerned to um, social stability risk, to economic insecurity risk um, in, in, in thinking about, about some of its behavior. The final point I want to make um, is about um, uh, the common ownership concerns. Um, and that is uh, when I've given this paper to other places, there's reaction, well, wait a minute, what you're doing is empowering um, these owners. Uh, and, and that points to the, the antitrust literature that's developed and shouldn't we be breaking up these owners. The, the um, putting aside the empirics, putting aside whether these, these actors would be acting in concert. Um, to me, the, the, the core issue is, is um, even if the asset managers here acted in concert, um, the effect would be to enhance consumer welfare rather than to reduce it. Um, that is to say the same systematic risk lowering activity, which may protect the value of their stock positions also protects the interests of the employees and the society who um, are, are associated with these firms. And so if there isn't this big economic implosion, um, yeah, you're gonna protect portfolio values, but guess what? You're gonna be protecting the real economy and the real economy consists of everyone else. So, and so ironically, the very collective action, which may prove a threat from uh, a competition um, uh, policy point of view in some scenarios, when it comes to mitigating systematic risk and eliminating uh, um, uh, the impact of systematic risk on the real economy and everyone who depends on it, then actually, as I say, you're improving social wel welfare rather than reducing it. Um, and indeed the point might be flipped, right? Which is to say, if you really, really care about climate change, if you think it is an existential risk, then actually what you want are these large owners to take a very vigorous role in acting against these firms. And the very power that some decry becomes the lever by which a form of, of transnational uh, governance can be employed against um, a threat that seems very grave, very grave indeed. So, so ironically, um, from a systematic perspective, um, um, the, uh, the politics of common ownership or the policy basis for common ownership, the policy value or of common ownership may flip from being um, a cost to um, a benefit. So why don't I stop at this point and uh, let's 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 talk. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, I I think it's it's great that if if you just want to. 
jump in and ask a question you can uh I'll just put question down in the in the chat we have a technical moderator or even though there is no one lined up also feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question thanks Uh, Giuseppe. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Hello, Hello. How are it's you? It's really great to see you. And, and it's nice to see how this project has developed since your first. Uh, I first saw it a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, yeah, it's I been a little slow, unfortunately. Um, so that's uh, you, you've gone a, a long way, I think. And um, I, I so if I, if I understand correctly the point, I think you're proposing a positive theory of systematic stewardship based on uh, essentially the incentives to of asset managers. And I was wondering about the normative implications. So you, you sketched a couple of them, uh, especially negative ones, like don't worry about uh, the common ownership problem. Right. But uh, my sense is that it could be, you know, more and uh, more positive uh, normative implications uh, through your theory. And um, and one might actually be the common you know, economic lingo, like remove externalities. So let these costs fall on the, uh, on the companies uh, so that then they trickle down the channels you propose and, and, and induce institutional investors to take action. Um, and I want it could be wide and share ownership so that you know, more and more of these costs will be uh, taken into account if share ownership is, is very concentrated on a restricted um, subset of the population, I think a lot of the uh, risks might actually not be reflected on, on that group and, and institutional investors might actually fail to take those into account. Um, and, and, and third, uh, what should the government do? I mean, it should, you know, what, one, one message I seem to be percolating from what you said is that they should stop bailing out uh, Wall Street uh, because you know every time they do that uh, because there is a big systemic shock, then uh, you know your, your your managers will fail to take that into account if they at least if they anticipate intervention. <clears throat> and a fourth set of implications would be. Uh, but I mean, you mentioned that you know, stop worrying about uh, funds being to intervention. Is actually let them do so because they are doing good. So I was wondering what your thoughts are about you know the, the broader normative implications of your positive. Theory. Yeah. Um, I, I I guess that there's some. You know, I'm not thinking about this through the framework of, of externalities. Um, you know, there is an overlap to be sure. Um, most things that uh, manifest themselves um, as systematic shocks can from another perspective be seen as the result of externalities associated with the behavior of firms. But in a way that that's really not, and, and, and so that's, I mean, that's a happy overlap, right? And I mean, in other words, that's why in effect the welfare effects of inviting these large owners to act in this way is positive because their self-interested behavior reduces um, the like likelihood of externalities and the risks of externalities. But um, but it's not... It, But um, I, I mean, rarely do you find, right, right, right. And, and, and so, but this is not, except this is not 
it's, it's not a complete fit. That is to say, I could imagine that there are many environmental harms which firms cause um, that don't have systematic implications. Uh, you know, they may make living in a certain community awful, but they don't have systematic implications and would be in effect untouched by the approach that I say is, is rational for a fully diversified fund to, to be going after. And so this isn't really a replacement for government action um, or for a, you know, an idea to hold firms into account. It's really to say that there's a certain class of, of, of dangers to um, the owner of a diversified portfolio, which if mitigated would have um, very beneficial effects, not only for the portfolio, but, the, but for the society at large. And there is the overlap. Um, and, and, and so that's in a way the, the approach that I think, and I think, you know, that's a, a nice, I think I should try to, to make that point clear uh, about the modesty of the claim, right? I mean, to my way of thinking, the power of the claim is, is very modest, is its modesty. That is to say, without, by asking these funds only to act in the interest of their beneficiaries, we can in certain very critical areas achieve a very powerful result. Um, and it doesn't carry with it uh, the, the analysis associated with, you know, with externalities, et cetera. Um, as to what the, these, these in, and so in that sense, you know, uh, do these systematic stewards have a view as to what the government ought to be doing about Waltz? Uh, you know, conditional on there being a crisis, you know, a systematic steward, of course, wants Wall Street to bail out. And, and insofar as um, it has influence over, I mean, you might say, look, they should pay a lot. Of, this means that they should be paying a lot of attention to um, uh, compensation pa packages at large financial firms. I wouldn't disagree with that. And uh, the real, uh, I mean, another question is, should they be involved in um, uh, encouraging the Fed to be very aggressive about, about stress tests for banks, for example, right? Um, and that to me is a question of prudential, you know, the bounds of prudential political behavior because the risk I see is that um, even if we think this power is being exercised in a socially beneficial way, you know, the political pushback in, in, in the exertion of any power by, by large owners is, is very real. I mean, Mark, Mark Rowe, et cetera, right? Uh, the political fragility of the consensus that would permit these firms to operate. So, so um, and, that, and this idea of prudence is a little bit why I'm suggesting that they should lead from behind, that they should, that they really, in this environment, I mean, that's why I think it's a, it's, it's an interesting idea because in this environment, the large asset managers don't have to be very forward leaning. Uh, there, 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 there are a lot of activists out there who are making proposals. And in a sense, um, what the large owners need, need to do is, is to decide what they think about these proposals, attempt to curate them perhaps, perhaps off, off, offer some guides as to which ones they, they would favor but they can just be voting as sh shareholders on proposals presented by others um, and, and express their, uh, their, their, uh, their power in that, in that way. And that, I, again, as I say, I think um, both recognizes their systematic interest, but calibrates their use of their power in a way that's as a shareholder rather than um, a proponent of, 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 of strong form interventions. Uh, Georg. Georg, yeah. Oh, 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 you're running the Celestio, I'll, I'll defer. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's online, so. <laughs> you, you both gave me the word, so I'll speak. Um, uh, Jeff, so basically, what you're discussing here is a trade-off between the beneficial effects of large asset managers and you're sort of ranking that higher than the antitrust concerns, the, the common, common owner ownership problem. And I was just wondering 
if there ever is any method of verifying this, or is there any any possibility of trying to come to a, um, a cost benefit comparison, basically that, that that would you know prove that you're right that the 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 benefits um, outweigh the cost essentially. So that's that's a, an economic question. The the other point I wanted to ask you about is the political concerns that that your point may raise because there are particularly in Europe, right? There are uh, rising skepticism towards uh, giving those decisions basically into the hands of the evil American fund manager, to put it very bluntly. And, and there, there's sort of democratic concerns that those managers are, have increasing power and decide de facto by their voting power of what corporations do. So basically, for example, decide uh, what is the correct way in investing uh, along the road and what, what counts as green, what doesn't count as green, what is sustainable, what is good for the economy, what is good for the society as a whole, right? So do the, another way of putting this question is, do we, are we sure that we entrust those fundamental questions to be taken by private institutions rather than democratic elected politi politician? Yeah, yeah, no, both of those are great questions. Um, you know, on the antitrust concern, the com I mean, the initiating common ownership concern. Um, you know, I'm I'm been a skeptic on the empirics. And there there's a new paper by um I'm forgetting um I think he's uh, the Spanish economist, but one of the part of the group of of the of the pa paper writers, yeah, Azar, uh, right. Jose, yeah. Jose Azar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. His latest paper essentially says never mind right uh I, you know i've redone it and actually in the constant in in, in the industries where uh, there seem, seem to be effect there really isn't this is about uh, i think his his example was was airline prices you know i i was um a skeptic about that empirical demonstration all along mostly because um for two, two, two reasons. First, um, just thinking about the airlines, uh, since the, the, um, the parties most affected by ticket prices are business travelers, because that's where the airlines ma make their money. Uh, why would a fully diversified share shareholder in effect want to encourage activity that would raise the price on firms in another part of the portfolio, right? I mean, that's, you know, hello, how does that work? Um, and then, and then um, uh, secondly, what's the channel? Um, um, I mean, ironically, one objection to the call for individual firm performance stewardship that Be Bebchuk and Hearst push is you would open up a channel. Uh, I mean, at the moment, uh, the the as they demonstrate, the actual stewardship activity by these asset managers is is very minimal. So so uh, and so, what's the channel for the the organization of collusive behavior? Um, well, if you have individual firm specific stewardship, you might open up a channel uh, where one doesn't exist. But but. At core, I've been a, a skeptic about the antitrust case, but I'm kind of throwing it back at those at those folks, which is to say, you know, and, and one of my colleagues, um, you know, in sort of in the progressive wing of, of air business, uh, sort of said, look, if 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 climate change really is the existential risk that many think it is, then uh, the concern about raising airline ticket pr prices by some small measure pales in, com in comparison to the power that these firms could exert collectively to, um, uh, 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 to, to get private business firms to reduce uh, the risk of, of, again, catastrophe. So the cost benefit analysis is at a completely different dimension. One is a, you know, a trivial change in you know, the cost of flying from, uh, um, uh, uh, 
New 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 York to Amsterdam, and the other is is the survival of the planet. So so you know that's not a hard argument to make. Uh, and once it's put out there, then you know it becomes tough to uh, refute. The second point you make, which is about you know the, the democracy deficit, right? What a what a great European line, um, and uh, and particularly you know uh, given that the asset managers are are have a many many cases of U.S. origin of voting, uh, you know it 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 it. Um, it's a poignant point. Uh, well, let me let me add to this, Jeff, because uh, we're all good friends, aren't we? But what if the world looked a little different and all the major asset managers were, were located in China, right? Then you know, would which we may happen, but which may happen in our life? Right, right, right. So, so the question is, you know, would be as comfortable as we are at the moment with those decisions basically being taken uh, at you know in in certain fund managers offices rather than in, you know, democratically elected leaders? Well, you know, um, I, I guess my line is um, conditional on the ownership patterns that we have. Um, what actions could we encourage those owners to take that would um, be desirable, you know, on these three elements of systematic risk, right? Um, um, so, so those are the, uh, you, I mean, I mean, what you raise is a very difficult question, um, truly, which is to say, if we're going to, I mean, if we have global firms and share ownership is, is open to all, um, to be sure, any firm that operates within a national border is su subject to national rules. Uh, the technology firms, the social media firms are finding that out. Um, but uh, you know, and 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 whether we 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 back into a weird form of global governance because through share ownership, because it's the only global governance we have, you know, I, I, that's a very that's a very hard question, um, and I don't really know what what to think about it, except that in the moment, use it to our advantage. That is to say, it is very hard to imagine any other way of getting global firms to restrain, to, to restrain their um, locally self-interested behavior in the name of the greater good, for example, the you know, as some, some of the systematic risks. It's not like national governments have done such a great job in solving this question, right? Um, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna overstate, right? I, I, I am not offering this as a first best. I'm just saying conditional on the ownership patterns of these asset managers, is there a, bis is there a role that they, they could play that would uh, relate to some of the deep, issues the world faces and, 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 you know, consistent with how we think they ought to behave given their business model, right? I mean, that's the, for me, that's the appeal of the argument. It's not asking them to do anything other than behave in a really, in this, you know, in a way that has appropriate regard for their role as, as diversified, as asset managers of ma maximally diversified uh, port, 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 portfolios trying to take care of their beneficiaries. And the claim of the paper, the appeal of it, from my perspective, is that with that fairly thin normative basis, you can achieve quite a lot from the point of view of, of, um, of, 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 of positive improvements on, on hard questions. 
I think there is from the chat, Constantina Marco, and then I would like to book a, a question by myself after you. Yes, um, um, I have more of a comment than a question really, but um, what you're discussing just uh, is very relevant to my work. And uh, I think, uh, so uh, I work as a due diligence officer. So my job is to um, check on asset managers on behalf of Dutch institutional investors, mostly uh, pension funds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the Dutch example, um, the Dutch central bank is a very strong regulator. So the Dutch central bank makes some very clear um, uh, guidelines for the mandates that the, the pension funds can invest in. And, you know, including also environmental um, standards and so on. And I think that this is forcing, you know, the, the pension funds to um, comply by these mandates and in their investments. And as a result, the asset managers as well. So from, from my point of view, this very strong regulatory uh, source is really affecting the process and, and kind of forcing asset managers to comply with local standards, but in a very, you know, uh, in a way that complies with, with your model as well. They're just doing their job basically. So I'm curious if you think if that would apply in the US as well, or the lack of a strong regulatory um, uh, standing wouldn't would make it not work as well i guess in the um i mean it's interesting you you bring, bring up that case because uh, the united states has just been through an episode in which uh uh the the regulator of pension funds uh was initially going to um bar pension funds from considering ESG matters in their investments um, on the grounds that that was not consistent with the obligation that they had um, uh, to manage solely, quote unquote, exclusively, quote unquote, for the financial, for, for the pecuniary benefit of their beneficiaries. So, so it was not insisting that they take ESG into account, it was making it difficult for them. And, well. <laughs> and, and the systematic stewardship argument, from my perspective, says there isn't a conflict necessarily across a broad range of ESG issues. But, but the Biden administration has essentially eliminated that, that guidance. But the fact is, is that most pension funds are focused on trying to maximize returns um, because um, and uh, because of the beneficiary interest and there isn't a regulator to uh, direct them otherwise. Moreover, pension funds are only a small fraction of the investor universe. So, so it wouldn't really, um, it wouldn't be sufficient because um, most, most, uh, um, you know, most money is um, comes without a mandate of that sort, and uh, so um, I, 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 I'm, 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 I mean, in a way, the regular, the the state level actor might be able to um, facilitate the. Um, creation of, of, of activists, of, of pension funds who would have a greater interest in ESG and who might initiate proposals. And so in that way, it would expand the universe of, of proponents of actions that other asset managers, the pure index fund managers could, could be responding to. And, and so in that way, be positive. But um, I don't think it's, uh, you know, a local solution here is going to be, uh, I mean, it's not forthcoming in the United States, at least in the present environment. Um, you know, the, I, I, I've, I've had this discussion with um, Vanguard people. And what they know is they offer uh, a full range of ESG funds. But most of their investors want to be in the plain vanilla index fund that doesn't come with a mandate. So, you know, um, uh, so having a, a, 
having the pension fund with a mandate won't fully address the, the issues. Thank you. So Jeff, if, if I may uh, abuse <laughs> my own somehow, I, 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 I think you're, I, I, I like your, your framework particularly because you know, it puts the role of index fund, larging the fund worldwide in an incentive compatible uh, framing. But I wonder quite frankly, whether it's too modest. Uh, it could actually deliver much more in terms of correction of internalities or even global governance uh, to, to, to refer to something was said before. Let me explain. Your, your, your main punchline is that the sludge investors should be doing the interest of their beneficiaries. But notably, and, and it's, it's also in your paper, so, but I don't understand how you actually operationalize this. This interest may include non-pecuniary concerns. I mean, in terms of the classic framework, uh, uh, CSR framework of Benaboa Tirol, I mean, the, the main approach you're taking is doing well by doing good. But there are some investors that want to go for uh, retail investors, like, like we, they want to go further right. and, and, and do address externalities. And you seem to account for it in the paper. What I don't understand is why uh, it, funds couldn't take that on board particularly in an environment, and that brings me to a second point I want to make, in which the choice to pursue ECG is not just a, a choice of private ordering. In Europe, particularly in the European Union, there's a process going on, you may aware, be aware of this, that is de determining a taxonomy of what is sustainable or what is not by regulation, a taxonomy that will inform the choice of these beneficiaries. Maybe right or wrong, of course, and it is open all kinds of discussion on political economy, but it, it exists in regulation, it's not yet in place because it has to be implemented, but will be implemented very soon. So I wonder whether there is, a, under these circumstances, you would consider extending your framework to indeed positive correction of externalities. What's the, um, the framework that you're referring to? Is, is this the, uh, the second directive, or I mean, the uh, the AIFMD uh, no, it's, or, well, it's the EU taxonomy. It's called the EU taxonomy regulation. It's, it, currently, it's, it's, it's limited to environmental sustainability, so it's essentially climate change goals, especially declining six main goals uh, that have to be defined in terms of technical standards. And this mm -hmm. technical standard, fast forward, will result in every Comp every large company, mainly listed companies, having to disclose to the public the proportion of their asset and their return that is green or sustainable. Oh, oh, oh! These are, this is this is a disclosure rule. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, but that seems to me, um, you know, just if favoring. You know, I, I didn't. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I mean, among the sort of the portfolio wide measures that um, I think fall within systematic stewardship would be uh, greater disclosure about risks that could have a systematic dimension because um, uh, adequate pricing of those risks um, first is desirable from the point of view of a portfolio investor, but also may put pressure on the relevant parties to mitigate them. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, effective disclosure standards that reveal the extent to which uh, institutional and, uh, sorry, a firm is exposed to systematic, um, systematic um, uh, Im impacts, I, I think would be uh, a desirable thing and it would be consistent with the mandate of uh, you know systematically stewarding <laughs> asset manager to favor that disclosure regime, um, so so I don't see any any inconsistency there. Um, uh, what were you? Um, oh, good. Some somebody is. Um, my, my point. What 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 I was implying. What if there is a subset of beneficiaries? Yeah. That choose to go beyond 
managing climate risk, which again, in terms of Benabutti old framing, the classic framing we are using about CSR is like doing well by doing good. So essentially yeah, yeah. the investor is maximizing long-term return by incorporating systematic risk. But some beneficiaries of this investor may want more, may want to give to future generation, for instance, which brings back the trade-off, but corrects potentially corrects externalities. Yeah, This right. is framed by regulation. Would it be acceptable, compatible with your framework? That was my question. Well, you know, either the risk that's being mitigated is systematic or not in the sense of, um, you know, I mean, to, to uh, you know, I'm, this approach doesn't attempt to exhaust the range of regulation a government might attempt to impose, uh, nor does it uh, attempt to uh, minimize the range of things that a majority of the shareholders might for a particular firm or set of firms seek to impose. Uh, but but, um, but I, I find it, if, if the asset manager is truly following out the financial imperatives, um, then it has to adjudicate whether the, the um, specific uh, green preferences of an investor group uh, for a particular firm uh, has a systematic dimension or not and thinking about how to vote, right? I mean, you know, it, it, um, uh, it doesn't have a, on this view, it doesn't have a mandate to um, put its thumb on the scale because a particular investor group um, has a, um, a, a, a what you might think think of as a, a super systematic, I mean, a beyond systematic desire for a firm to behave in a particular way, right? Um, that's what I mean by, by the modesty of the claim. It doesn't purport to uh, um, exhaust all the possible things a shareholder might want from, from a firm or to limit the firm. And so you might say, well, then is this, and and uh, what does then common ownership get in the way of of, of share of of groups of share, shareholders who have these strong um, concerns? And um, I, I mean, the reality is. Um, Going back to the Vanguard example, most investors um, don't have that taste, right? Most investors are not green. Um, and, and so this is, from my perspective, if you want firms to behave in, in a particular way, that's, that's really the job of government, um, uh, not of the investors. Uh, and, and in a sense, maybe, maybe what this is about is to point to a category of concerns where self-interested investors ought to be engaged, um, even if governments are passive or even if governments are inactive. But um, it's not, it, go, it goes back to the discussion with Giuseppe, this is not um, really about the control of externalities. It's just a different point and it has desirable outcomes, but it's not the complete universe of things, policy concerns we might wanna pursue, nor is it meant to be an exclusive instrument for that. You know, it, it goes to what can we expect from the owners of these firms, right? They're economically motivated. Um, and, and, uh, so, 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 so shareholder voting is going to only carry you, but so far, I think doesn't replace the need for other government. I mean, for government, for governance, not corporate governance, but for governance, you know, um, So Jeff, if I can jump in uh, the, the discussion, um, 
I, I think there is a scope for thinking about externalities. And uh, I, I see, uh, if I understand Alessio's question correctly, I think he had in mind a similar um, uh, point. And that is, you know, one, one question is whether systematic stewardship will reduce externalities. Another question is, what are the conditions for systematic stewardship to work? So, for example, you know, there is a risk out there that is somewhat systemic. So one way to reduce it is to address the causes of the risk. Another way to reduce it is to move it to somebody else who's outside your economic constituency, so to speak. And I think Georg was alluding to that as well. You know, you can think about it as political representation, but you can think about this problem as possibly as externalities. So if COVID comes up and, you know, and, and there is an expectation that this comes up, uh, stewardship might involve policies to reduce this risk, but by, it might also involve political pressure <clears throat> in order to let the costs associated with the risk fall somewhere else. You know, that, that, that could be could come in the form of, of bailouts, of, of uh, subsidies, of uh, uh, international <clears throat> uh, competition along some, some levels. Georg was alluding to you know, managers being in some other country. Um, so I, I think that was a bit behind the couple of the questions that were being asked. Yeah. Um... You mean the 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 cost shifting the cost shifting elsewhere? Um, yeah, in a sense. So I'm not I'm not saying you know this doesn't take away from the powerful um, features of your approach. I think what we have in mind is you know just working on the on the boundary, which things would be in and which things would be out, right? So we're not I I don't think we're not questioning how powerful that is, but. You know, yeah, where, yeah, where is yeah. the boundary? Where is the boundary? That's that's a bit of yeah. Question. Well, um, <clears throat> well, you know, I, I I think that's 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 um, obviously difficult, right? Um, and and once firms understand their role, once asset managers understand their role. Um, then, then obviously the boundary issues become important. And um, look, um, I mean, there, there's a political economy valence as well here, <clears throat> which is um, an interesting one. And, and in a way it was in, inherent and the reversal of the common ownership critique, which is to say, um, uh, all of these asset managers exist on political sufferance, right? And and sort of like one, I've I've suggested an argument that they can make to to policymakers who say you're too big, you own too many shares, you're too powerful. The response is, well, look. Um, our power can be in service of mitigating these extremely important systematic concerns, and you should, uh, in, a, in effect, enable us to continue to exist. Um, to which the political actors could respond, um, uh, the get out of jail free card isn't limited to systematic concerns. And um, that is to say, there's a menu of concerns of, of which we'll call externality control, uh, which we think um, your role as sh shareholder oblige you to consider as well. Um, and so then you get into, <clears throat> and, and then I'm just pl playing this out a little bit, um, apart from the self-interested reason that the managers of BlackRock have in maintaining the franchise they have, right? So that's an agency cost issue. They could also think that our beneficiaries are better off if we are allowed to exist because we can offer a very valuable service to them. And if the cost is playing um, you know, a broader role in the control of externalities, in response to 
uh, the requests of political actors, then that's, you know, um, that's a role we'll play because we exist and, and it's in our beneficiaries. And so, and so in a sense, I, the trade that I've proposed, in a sense, you less us exist because we're addressing systematic concerns, isn't not, isn't necessarily limited to <laughs> only systematic concerns. And so in a way, this, this goes to Georg's point, right? Um, so the Europeans, if they're smart, could, I don't want to put it that way, uh, an argument might, might be made that the regulators could see the role of these asset managers as letting them promote certain uh, um, important environmental goals, which the asset managers might not necessarily think fall strictly within the systematic boundaries, but nevertheless, for which a good case could be made. And if the choice is, do we get to have a European license or not? Uh, then we would be more inclined to go in this direction than otherwise, right? So, so that's a way to kind of retrade the social license uh, that permits the asset managers to have free free reign in other in other domains. And so it picks up that they would be attuned to acting in this way because they genuinely perceive their systematic risks. And if then, in a sense, you're you're extending into areas where there is um, uh, some question about that, then, you know, uh, that, that might be the way to do it. We're almost running out of time, but I see one end. If you have a patient, uh, Paola yeah, yeah, Perotti sure. wants to ask a question, please keep it short. We are a bit over time. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll be very quick. Thank you, Professor Gordon. I loved your presentation. Last month, um, the CEO of Danone was uh, sacked by investors. He was greener than thou, you know, all great and good, but he wasn't making any money. Um, a few weeks ago, um, the, the Natural Conservancy uh, Trust that uh, helps BlackRock and Vanguard fund managers sleep better at night by giving them credit offsets for the traveling said, well, we're not sure we're doing any good to uh, the, the globe at all. You know, perhaps all this credit uh, 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 offsetting is all a worthless palaver. I wonder to what, I, you know, to me, uh, there is a real risk that fund managers will only pick the fights they can win. And I wonder whether something uh, more like what uh, the US administration has come through, you know, the very bold proposal of taxing firms globally at a certain threshold would probably not be a, a better way. So couldn't be a additional way to help address your systematic uh, risk. Thank you. Uh, look, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, global governance, if it's um, feasible, um, certainly in many domains is, is um, preferred for many reasons, um, but uh, it might not be so um, I, I mean, in a world in which they're private firms and they have global reach and, and, and their activities are very hard to identify and uh, limit, um, it's, it's kind of a feasibility point in a way. I mean, remember the idea of, of this, of, of, of uh, proposing um, a uniform corporate tax, you know, that's a proposal. Uh, some of my colleagues were, you know, I was in a discussion last week in which they said it won't work because basically even if there is a uniform rate of, let's say, 20 percent, um, uh, sort of the headline rate, and everybody agrees, uh, what happens if, 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 um, if uh, the Netherlands, for example, gives... Um, accelerated depreciation um, allows firms to expense machinery, right? And so all of a sudden, yeah, there's the headline rate of 20%, but you know, the after-tax income has been dramatically reduced by some tax 
expenditure. How do you, right, um, uh, right, right, or Panama, as Georg says. Um, uh, so, but the Danon case, I just want to come back, back to that. So it's not clear to me if the reason the activists sacked or led the shareholders to sack the Danon CEO was because of ESG. I mean, in other words, these firms are supposed to be making money. It's 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 not that if you you know if you're quote green end quote um, that that if you're not a well managed firm that that's a that that's that that insulates management from sh shareholder accountability. It's I don't think the argument was because Danone, uh because it was ESG, it made no money for the shareholders. I, I, I think it was that um, uh, he wasn't a good manager and ESG, which is desirable, is not an excuse for not being a good manager. Uh, I mean, there's a firm in the United States called, which makes Siggy's yogurt, which um, you know I just had some this morning. Uh, uh, which is a, a very green firm, but I think I think they do very well for uh, the shareholders. So so I'm not sure that there's the inevitable tension between being a money ma making firm and not. You know, let me just on on one point here, um, which uh, there's from 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 thinking about this, there's been far too much focus on the fossil fuel producing firms, and. I, I think the focus on divestment is um, um, misguided because if you, first of all, if you no longer are a shareholder, you no longer have any voice in what the firm does and you replace the shareholders who might be concerned about gr green issues with those who, who aren't and sort of um, it now seems a moment when many of these firms are interested in making a transition. But in any event, most of the fossil fuels in the United States are not in the world, sorry, are not extracted by privately owned firms. They're by state-owned oil firms um, about whom, you know, the shareholder movement has no effect. The target ought to be the users of fossil fuels. So, so basically, it's first order importance. I think that GM has essentially said by, you know, 2025, a, a very large fr fraction of its fleet is going to be electric, and they're going to phase out of internal combustion engine by what, 2030 or 2035. So, so in a sense, the 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 effort ought to be on every maker of automobiles to do that. I mean, it's really it's it's the users of these. Uh, from my perspective, it's the users of fossil fuels that ought to be the target. Of, of shareholder attention rather than uh, the producers, um, in part because the state-owned firms are immune from the pressure, but also it's the transition that needs to occur is 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 really in the demand for fossil fuels, not not um, the uh, production of them. Um, and you know, and so you know, and that's a discussion that again I've been trying try to push on the asset managers as they think about. The activities that they might be uh, pursuing as um, systematic stewards. So, well, so would would the let me just ask uh, some somebody in the chat put the list of the uh, the various um, the yes, this is this European. Uh, yeah, if somebody yeah, could yes. email me that, if if I, if, I will. Renee Smith, yeah, I would appreciate that because the chat will not in the chat maybe. anymore. But I, oh, I will, right. I will, I will, I will. I'm, I'm actually working on this thing. So we have our meeting afterwards. I would like to thank you uh, uh, on behalf of all uh, the Amsterdam Center of Law and Economics and the colleague present here for, for uh, this enlightening presentation, uh, Jeff, and this uh, great discussion. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, yeah, uh, we will keep you posted on the future uh, initiative of uh, the Amsterdam Center of Economics. There's a conference about a month where we speak also about common ownership. So thanks for being with us. Uh, Jeff, we'll have a couple of one-on-one -on -one meetings.